Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to get started um, right away since we have five amazing presentations to get through this evening. Um, so thank you for joining us uh, this evening for the final of five installments of Projecting Fellows hosted at the University of Virginia. Um, we, Kyle Schumann and Katie McDonald, uh, will begin with a brief overview before handing the reins to this evening's moderators. Please note the sessions being recorded and information on participants and recorded sessions of the, the previous four events can be found on the event website at projectingfellows.com. We want to express our continued gratitude to the moderators and fellows who have made this series possible and to the University of Virginia School of Architecture for hosting the events, including Dean Isla Berman and Chair of Architecture, Felipe Correa for their support, Sneha Patel and Darcy Engel for facilitating the series, Chris Coat for art direction and graphic design, Weiha Wang for website design and development, and also to the University of Tennessee Director of Architecture, Jason Young for taking a chance on the two of us as co-fellows. Several architecture schools nationwide annually name fellows to develop an intensive research or teaching project during a short-term appointment. The fellowship offers some combination of project support, cross-pollination between research and teaching, and a platform from, with which to present work. Selected via national searches, fellowship projects are duly indicative of emerging interests and institutional agendas. This January and February, the 2019 to 2020 fellows, some of whom have completed their fellowship while others are still in progress, convene to explore rising tides and the vehicle of the fellowship project. The series serves three audiences, who might, uh, the fellows who might find a dispersed collectivity, an emerging generation of aspiring scholars and architects who might learn about the fellowship as a kind of incubator, and the broader architecture community who might converge across geographic, institutional, and ide ideological boundaries. The evening will consist of five presentations by fellows followed, followed by moderated discussion. We encourage audience participation by using the chat to post questions and observations throughout the evening, and moderators may call on questions from the audience as well. Tonight, the discussion will continue with a session broadly themed modes of practice, and we're honored to introduce tonight's moderators. Please join us in welcoming Aaron Bessler, assistant professor at, at Princeton University and co-founder of Bessler & Sons, a studio that, brings, that designs buildings, software, objects, exhibitions, and interiors, and has been recognized as Next Progressives by Architect Magazine. Bessler's work is characterized by a particular interest in construction technologies, social media, and other online platforms for producing and sharing content where digital interactions rely less on expertise and more on ubiquity. Bessler was previously the 2013 to 14 AUD Teaching Fellow at UCLA, a Fellow of the American Academy in Rome, the recipient of the Architectural League of New York uh, Young Architects Prize, and a 2019 United States Artists Fellow in Architecture and Design. Bessler received a Bachelor of Arts from Yale University and a Master of Architecture with Distinction from the Southern California Institute of Architecture. It is a pleasure to also introduce Seku Cook, Assistant Professor at Syracuse University and founder of Seku Cook Studio. Cook's research, current research centers on the emergent field of hip hop architecture, a theoretical movement reflecting the core tenets of hip hop culture with the power to create meaningful impact on the built environment and give voice to the marginalized and underrepresented within design practice. Cook's upcoming monograph is entitled Hip Hop Architecture, and Cook is featured in the exhibition Reconstructions, Architecture, and Blackness in America at the Museum of Modern Art, which opens on February 20th. Cook is also a published columnist, lecturer, and exhibitor, and has played leadership roles in various organizations, including those advocating the expanded presence of minorities in architecture. Cook holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University and a Master of Architecture from Harvard University and is licensed to practice architecture in New York State. Seku and Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. We'll, we'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Kyle. Um, thanks for those introductions. Um, I'll just quickly say that um, Syracuse University is also home of the Harry D. Bergosian Fellowship. So one of our uh, fellowships is, has been um, highlighted in this series. So it's a really excellent series um, that Kyle and Katie have put together. Um, uh, in, a, in a moment, I'll, I'll turn it over to Erin to introduce themselves and, and to introduce the first of our presenters. 
after all five presentations have been made, then we will engage in a bit of a conversation about the presentations and then pull in um, the, the presenters for, to, as part of that conversation. And then um, hopefully have enough time to bring in the general audience for questions. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Erin. Great, thanks Seku. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, uh, our first presenter is Mena Ahmed Aga. Uh, Mena was the 2019-2020 Design for Spatial Justice Fellow at the University of Oregon and is founder of Project Unsettled. Aga holds a Master of Arts from the Technical University of Cologne and a PhD in Architecture from University of Antwerp. Um, so thank you so much, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Hi, I am going to share my screen now. And voila. So Hello everybody, this has been fun. I was really looking forward to today. Um, I am Minna, uh, as um, um, as Erin kindly introduced me, and I was one of the Spatial Justice Fellows at the University of Oregon, um, which was an honor uh, last year, um, and where I had the freedom and the space to somehow run this kind of experiment that uh, emerged out of my research out of my PhD research on architecture education and um, the emotional, this, this issue of the emotional. So uh, by now, after I am finished, you've been, you will be uh, done with all four of us, the first uh, semester um, fellows. After that, we were joined by uh, two magnificent fellows, Professor Corey Parker and Professor Craig Wilkins. Uh, who are not a part? We're not a part of this series, but I'm sure uh, I'm sure you have enjoyed Karen, Priyanka, and Zana's uh, talks. Um, well, my PhD research was uh, again uh, um, against the better judgment of many of my supervisors about my village and my grandmother's house in a small displacement village in Egypt. I am a third generation displaced Nubian which is an indigenous African um, uh, ethnicity that is now divided between Egypt and uh, Sudan. And my research questions vary between uh, questions on the marginal and why is it very important for the marginal to build and questions on drawing as a language of displacement in architecture, the questions of the emotional and questions about how to be displaced from where you have never been. I was never in my uh, ancestral land that was the submerged in the 60s. I was born in the 80s, yet I identify as a displaced. So all these kind of special questions gu guide and usher uh, my research and teaching. And uh, in Oregon, I, I kind of had this agenda and I tried to focus on the emotional. And I had two exercises. One is the teaching exercise for the students, which was about the emotional training. And the other one was an exercise for me on epistemic positioning. S starting the day I stepped my feet in an architecture class and in schooling in general, what happens is that, is that as I get epistemically displaced from the knowledge in that um, resides with my grandmother. It's discounted, uh, African knowledge is discounted, it's uh, devalued, it's not going to be my means for um, uh, economic and social mobility. So I have to go into class and twist my hand into performing spatial production as my professor says. And uh, if you don't know that, if you study architecture in Egypt, South Africa, India, um, in the US and or in Europe, we're all studying a very Eurocentric um, curriculum and architecture. All our practice is highly Eurocentric, even if you study in Egypt. Somebody who studied in Egypt like myself had to, had to learn about Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe and all these white men. Anyways, so what I try to do here is to position myself in the quintessentially African paradigm of the emotional. And the emotional here is not 
what you think of it, what it's just, just the emotions. It is the uh, moral framework in which uh, African communitarianism um, happens. So how do I now as a teacher refuse to be complicit in my own epistemic displacement and offer a different paradigm, a different way of teaching in a time now as we are all secluded, really appreciate and would really um, uh, need uh, and to make sense of the emotion in our life. So I designed this uh, kind of program uh, across the year uh, with teaching studios and seminars. Uh, and I especially focused on uh, the drawing um, modules and the studios. So these were uh, where I really injected uh, emotional training and emotional exercises. And especially for this, the, this gray line is a continuous project that goes from the, a design project all the way to a design build. So it's a, also a continuous project that is also highly emotional. And let me tell you how that works. Um, well, another thing I'm trying to, to do is the uh, issue of anxiety and anxieties around money. I know in the US a student would pay a decillion dollar to go to a university, but uh, to me, a, an architecture studio should never ever um, be a, a site of, of, of economic disparity. Uh, to me, all my studios and all my seminars are zero cost. You don't, you don't pay money to be in my studio or to, to be in studio in general. I think architecture education is one of these uh, uh, issues that we need to really discuss about access to our field. And this was one of these, um, uh, one, of my, uh, some, uh, one of my courses, this was 150 students and we gave them um, uh, um, files, vector files to print their tools to make sure that nobody can pay because this, this was a drawing module and we had to give them, uh, they had to buy something and we made sure that nobody buys more than, pays more than $20 across the entire class. And for this one, which was um, uh, more of an elective, uh, I could inject a bit more to a, a bit more advanced students. I could inject a bit more uh, of an exercise. And this was an exercise on schizocartography. So how do we map while giving ourselves the agency to map what we want. So uh, the, the exercise was to map the university. And what happened is that some students mapped the, the capitalist uh, aspects of their university. Um, some students um, also looked at anxiety, spaces of anxiety. And uh, some students looked at um, the places where people uh, hook up in the university, which was really fun to know that pretty much everywhere in our campus students hook up and it's a, like an, a, a secret that shouldn't appear. And, and it was such a good conversation about bodies and bodies that should or should not appear and theory of the erotic. And they, um, it was also very interesting to discuss what deserves to be drawn. What, who gets to decide what gets to be drawn? When you start um, an exercise on mapping, are you really representing your conviction or are you being an agent of a larger institution perpetuating it because that's a part of your training? And that was a, the, the point with, with sketch, sketch cartography. But then the, the, the regime itself, and luckily many of the students have taken most of these uh, studios with me. So they like had the, the whole portion. Um, was the studio sequence. And I had, I ran three studios. And the idea was based on this paper I just published on the object and emotional labor, uh, uh, emotion as a capital, how it performs as a power and how it produces other capitals, including material capital, which means space in our in our case. So the first the first exercise we ran was on relationality and was uh, titled the house as a political and every student and the main exercise that is that every student would relate to a certain group outside the heteronormative capitalist um, typologies of house and housing and redefine that typology and imagine another life, a different life. And what, what would the house look at that point? But that the hardest exercise was to actually to relate to somebody outside the center, especially when most of the students were cis and um, middle class and 
somehow disassociate from indigenous issues, for example. So it was very hard and was such a, a, a heavy thing to go on and, and, and be confronted with the fact that we don't have enough information on most of the issues we claim in architecture and our social project to, to be tackling. Uh, let me, the, the, the second project was on squatting. And this, the reason we, I did this was an issue of agency. And I you know this one doesn't sound, um, uh, the, uh, the, the issue of agency itself is a highly emotional practice. When you go into an office in your first year after you graduate and you get a piece of teeny tiny bit of drawing in an office like a piece of office in a larger project. And then you discover that that project is something that really is against your political interest, but you have to do it because you got trained to be so pragmatic and utilitarian and you don't, you haven't learned through architecture how agency works and how to break rules. And to me, it was very important to uh, kind of work against laws and rules and understand them very well. So we, we started reading extensively. I think um, the students were really surprised. They had, I think, 60 pieces of reading and we had to do them collectively on the history of squatting, uh, adverse position laws, um, movements around the world's ways in, in which we can uh, claim space. And the other question is, what are we if we're not commissioned? So what? who am I as an architect if somebody doesn't give me money? Am I idle? Is there nothing I can do if nobody gives me money? So it was uh, also this experiment with the zero budget project. So the project doesn't have any budget, but we still have to do something. And the third one, and this one um, started at the first first uh, um, project on the house as a political, as a group of students said, well, we say the city should be the typology of a house. And we came up with, a, with this project, the city as a house. And how the city, how in case, if you don't have a house, or, or if you have a house, these are all construct of the public-private dichotomy. The city is responsible to provide care for those who roam it and exist in it. And we then did a bunch of research on the unhoused community in Eugene and um, started working with the Food for Lane County to uh, kind of uh, upgrade and uh, do some design, which was something our client did not like. The unhoused community really doesn't like the word design. It's an, um, a marker of... Uh, uh, gentrification. So we did some um, interventions and we worked and we helped during the pandemic, which was not fun. Uh, but it was when the pandemic hit, it was much needed. Let me show you pictures uh, of what happened instead of me just going on and on before my time goes. So with the house as a political, the students explored issues with care and women. Um, uh, women uh, surviving, how women would survive spatially uh, spousal abuse or um, uh, issues like uh, anarcho-syndicalism. Uh, how do we work with um, in visual impairment, for example, but then when we ask, actually ask people with visual impairment, how does it look like? And, and then these kind of emotional interactions and everybody had to, to speak to real people. Uh, so it was uh, such a... a, um, a an emotional confrontation to the students. And uh, also a, a group had a very profound uh, com confrontation with queer space and queer theory beyond its if, um, if aesthetics, but in its um, core of use. And uh, I had them extensively read Sarah Ahmed and it was fun. I, I think I assigned much readings, uh, but they had no right. For Squatter by Design, it was also such a, uh, um, a good uh, project where uh, everybody had a very different, every student had a very different uh, way to squat something. You want me to, you want me to run, right? Just wrap up as much as you okay. can. Okay. So for example, if you can hide in language, so if you can hide, if you can re, 
draw a building and then hide in it and then so squat it. And these kind of pluriversal perspectives and um, other ways, um, non-antagonistic ways of squatting that has appeared. Uh, I'm sure a bunch of the students are watching this now with fabulous work. And then the city is a house, that's the design build that we ended up doing. And uh, we were trying to um, somehow uh, create a more shading elements um, less hardscapes, more softscapes, more greens, more color. And these are the things uh, we were required by our customer, but not design. So we did not do design. We did what we were uh, requested to do. But it was a quintessentially also an exercise of care. So we looked at cleaning as architectural work. We looked at detailing as a labor of care. The, the, our, the kind of uh, very monotonous detailing that we have to do in, in the studio or in construction uh, class as labor of care. Um, so after um, an excruciating amount of time, and very, very stubborn bunch of, bunch of students who went with the students beyond the credit, beyond the semester, beyond anything. It was about service to them. And this, this is, I think, a very Oregonian um, phenomena. The, there is this type of an Oregonian student that is an, a unicorn that engages emotionally and are so susceptible to this kind of curriculum I have offered them. Uh, so it was um, such a privilege to work with them. And thank you very much. Um, um, I'm sorry I went over time, and you can find more on my website. Thanks, thanks, Mena. Thanks for that presentation. Um, next up, we have uh, Matis Groskov Manis. Um, and Matis Groskov Manis was the 2019 2020 Walter B. Sanders Fellow at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's currently a teaching assistant professor at Aarhus School of Architecture in Denmark. Um, Groskov Manis holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the Glasgow School of Art and a Master of Architecture from Delft University of Technology. Please welcome Matis Groskov Manis. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you Sakhar, for the uh, introduction uh, and good evening to everyone especially those who are in the European time zone, which is like a very late, late evening, but I hope that's not gonna impair my uh, uh, presentation tonight. Um, uh, I must say that my uh, presentation comes from a very different place than, than what we saw in previously, but I totally, I mean, I, I feel like now I should change what I'm gonna present to you tonight because I totally agree that emotional intelligence and emotional uh, training something that is uh, absolutely lacking from the architectural uh, uh, discourse and and, and in, in some strange way I think uh, I will try to kind of uh, show my take on this uh, problem. Um, right, let me try to share the screen. Oh, uh, just a second, sorry. Uh, okay, this is, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't work yet? It's okay, um, we won't dock your time. Oh, wait, just a second, just a second. Um, sorry. Oops, did, did we lose him? It, it looks like we lost, oh, he, he's coming back. All right, my apologies. Uh, I, I switched to a different laptop, so I had to change my settings. Anyway, one minute uh, uh, less for my presentation. <laughs> um, all right, let's try to present now. Right, uh, do, okay, do you see the full screen? Is it, is it working out? Perfect. All right, cool, that's fantastic, okay. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, um, I just wanted to say in general, uh, I'm uh, uh, just to reflect on fellowship. I come from uh, practice. Uh, I've studied and practice in Europe. So basically, arriving uh, at Tom Newton College was my first time in the U.S. So and, to, and like a first time in engaging with the U.S. Uh, scene. Uh, uh, I haven't studied the history of theory. So what you will hear tonight may or may not be based on, on, on academically validated uh, research. 
Um, so uh, for many years, I've been kind of working for uh, uh, a multinational architectural practices uh, and basically uh, multinational architectural companies uh, such as MVRDV and OMA slash AMO. Uh, so before I became a fellow at Taubman College, uh, my previous job was a project architect, a job which involves both uh, uh, design, but maybe more importantly, the management of design. Um, so for the fellowship, I propose to look at the organizational models of architectural practices, uh, particularly trying to focus on kind of uh, technologies of, uh, of management. Uh, and my hunch or, or my starting hypothesis were that due to kind of broader shifts in economy over the last decades, such as uh, dematerialization, digitalization of tools, and in a way, it, it kind of the, the infusion of economy in social life and, and in all its spheres, all of these have some, somehow significantly altered the way architectural practice uh, operates, especially once it grows uh, beyond a, a certain uh, scale. Uh, and, and, and that's when the kind of organizational design of the practice becomes its own kind of central uh, project. Um, more specifically, I was quite uh, uh, fascinated by the way that uh, there's, there's this constant pressure for architecture to increase its productivity uh, you know, either through technological innovation or, or organizational design um, and, and the kind of all, all kinds of other tools that basically kind of reduce the waste and in, improve the efficiency of architecture. And, and normally we, we could look, look uh, a lot of, uh, in the history of business management theory and, you know, the kind of industrial capitalism and how there were these gradual kind of uh, uh, epiphanies of how to optimize the production uh, from the production lines to kind of uh, uh, organizational charts of big corporations uh, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, but at the same time, there's also a kind of parallel history of the kind of design management and architectural management, which of course happened much slower than at a different pace. But, but uh, the whole kind of central theme of my fellowship was that it's not just uh, large corporate offices, but in a way uh, 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 it, it becomes kind of a, a, an inescapable kind of a, a theme for basically any office or any, any practice that's operating in, in the market conditions uh, today. Um, and, and it's important to know that our architectural labor is immaterial and it cannot be kind of subjected to inventory management, i.e. you know stockpiled in a warehouse or something like that. So um, in a way running the a practice is like always a kind of very balancing, a very careful balancing act between immediate demand and supply of architectural services and and, and there's the whole there's this whole array of tools to uh, uh, support this uh, process um, so the architectural practice is a company um, and companies operate in kind of economic uh, environments um, so some economists have argued that uh, the economic boom that accelerated in 1990s so not that long ago, was actually based largely on immaterial consumptions of symbols, ideas, uh, brands, and other immaterial uh, objects. Um, French social philosopher André Gorge has stated that by late 1990s, uh, the material capital of the American industry represented only one third of the total stock market uh, capitalization, uh, while the kind of immaterial or intellectual capital of uh, most companies reached levels between five and 16 times higher than their kind of material and financial capital. Um, so the market the dynamics are kind of increasingly uh, getting decoupled from material realities of our world. And I think we don't need to look too far uh, in the history to see all kinds of uh, examples of that, not to mention the, the recent surge of a game, GameStop uh, a share price that we are still recovering from. Uh, uh, but also things like cryptocurrencies, crypto art, and crypto fashion, and all the other kind of immaterial artifacts that we pay real money for, but they have no physical uh, presence. Um, so let's say, in a way, what I was looking at is how the dematerialization of value, uh, you know, leads to all kinds of questions for architecture and for architecture practice, right? So how can architecture in a way, um, reconfigure its uh, productive capacities and its organizational structures in this new kind of financialized, accelerating and information driven uh, reality where physical built form is not necessarily the end goal uh, anymore. And in the many instances, uh, what architecture is, is more like a, a small part of some kind of larger uh, special products. Um, so you know, and, and, and we could think of this kind of like like post post 90s uh, architectural practice model where 
technological management uh, uh, are kind of you know making it possible to build things or to at least design uh, things with a relatively small uh, labor force uh, and at the same time uh, because of uh, semi-automated design processes, uh, subcontractors, and, and some kind of specialization, you know, it's possible to kind of really maintain a high speed, high volume uh, production uh, strategy. Um, and then also, of course, maybe this kind of like semi-real, sometimes virtual architecture that is, at least in a, in a design sense, made of this like nondescript uh, substance that can accommodate any form, thickness, curvature, any materiality, uh, any uh, conditions. Um, so, and in a way, the kind of introduction of uh, uh, BIM uh, stacks, and, and that's something that I also I kind of experienced while I was working in the practice, uh, was maybe kind of like the best way to illustrate uh, uh, that kind of managerial term, which I also tried to look at in my fellowship. Um, so I, I was kind of really fascinated to see how Revit has become like almost a commonplace kind of medium to uh, uh, conduct and, and coordinate uh, uh, design in the industry. And what's interesting is that in a way, it, it really kind of reminds this uh, uh, almost like a multiplayer video game, uh, you know, where, 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 where basically uh, people could design, build, quantify, monitor this built environment in some kind of total uh, way. Uh, and, and in a way, more and more bits of kind of material reality are cloned into these digital simulation models aimed to kind of predict and improve architecture's performance and efficiency. Um, you know, and of course, it, it renders previously invisible layers uh, visible, right? So uh, we, we could think that it's like, you know, with all kinds of things and protocols that are contaminating, uh, you know, architectural concepts and forms with all the kind of other information. Um, but of course, making things visible also has kind of uh, maybe, uh, yeah, in, in a way, open up new dimensions of uh, thinking of architectural projects. And again, that's something that I observed in my own kind of previous experience prior to the fellowship. Uh, um, in a way that, you know, that it, it was more and more kind of possible to understand uh, uh, me as an architect working in larger teams of people who are involved beyond my office uh, 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 and people who I didn't even know actually kind of in a way existed uh, within the project. Um, so in a way that was, it, it, it was like new way of, of, of seeing architectural projects and also the, the architectural workforce. Um, but of course, at, at the same time, new ways of seeing uh, do, did not necessarily seem that they also imply new ways of intervening or new ways of acting. Um, perhaps the opposite, uh, you know, because it's, it seems that uh, to a large extent, these kind of like techno-managerial stacks are closed uh, black box uh, systems uh, that in a way can only work with kind of predefined set of protocols and, and, and design approaches. Um, so. In the fellowship, I really kind of uh, had a chance to step back from that experience in a way and, and, and try to kind of uh, really take advantage of these kind of incredibly generous conditions uh, that were given to me by the by Tobon College uh, to maybe conduct several more precise uh, investigations uh, and speculations uh, within these uh, themes. And I really felt that uh, the whole project kind of was something in between uh, these different uh, kind of uh, categories of uh, kind of self-directed PSYOP, art project, academic project, and a startup. And all, all, all those things were like happening uh, at, at the same time. Um, and of course, I, I investigated that through teaching, uh, but also through an independent study. Uh, and also just most importantly, just being part of absolutely fantastic and intellectually, I would say quite a libertarian uh, environment uh, in, in the school. Um, and, and I think from today's perspective, I, th I would say that the fellowship or the kind of best value of the fellowship is that it's really like a year long uh, conversation between uh, uh, me and the other fellows uh, who were developing their own projects uh, parallel to mine. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so Jacob Comerci and Eduardo Madero, uh, uh, who you will uh, hear from uh, after me, but also Jacob was part of the, one of the previous sessions of this uh, event. Um, but of course, it also was a conversation between uh, other faculty members with the head of the school and also with uh, all of my students, uh, several of whom uh, became uh, fantastic collaborators uh, in my own fellowship project over the years. So shout out to Gary Zhang, Lindsay Baranko and Catherine Mallory, uh, just to use the platform. <laughs> um, so um, to a large extent, uh, the, the, the idea was to kind of try to see how we can find also common, commonalities with, with two, two other fellows. Um, and in a way, very early on, we decided to make our show under the kind of umbrella title of Practice Product Protocol. 
So these are the three topics that gradually converged into a single uh, exhibition and in a way kind of like, again, like a single ongoing uh, discussion throughout the whole uh, academic year covering things like domestic simulations, uh, financial formations, as well as managerial hallucinations. Um, That's 10. Yeah, so right. I'm, I'm, you're okay, but you can, yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. message received. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the three big parts of my fellowship project, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, part of that was just trying to render things uh, visible. And what you see here is a few of series of uh, flowchart drawings that were kind of uh, try to chart various transformations that have taken place uh, through architectural practice over the last decades. So from architecture corporation to AEC firm, from architecture to architecture of the market, from commodity to spectacle, from architectural modernity to post-architectural modernity, uh, and so on. And each of those things is actually based on actual kind of theoretical uh, text that was kind of like reinterpreted into this kind of uh, managerial uh, chart. Um, uh, so I think the, the main and the largest component of the fellowship was actually like a video game simulation of, of a kind of hyper-managerial architecture office. Um, and, and I think the idea was trying to kind of really work with, uh, let's say, uh, non-linear multi-directional storytelling and in a way try to kind of make this an immersive environment trying to really kind of see how these like AI scripted architects would actually work within the office and, 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 and how this like kind of highly optimized environment would actually uh, function. Um, so, so I thought that it was like digital walkthrough experience, something that you would normally do for buildings and special products to kind of market the potentials of them. Um, and in a way, this thing was made as a non-game, so there are no structured goals, no objectives, and no challenges. It's just a way to wander through through the office, and, and in, in a way, some kind of like maybe discover the kind of like efficiencies and deficiencies of this kind of like perfectly measured and productive uh, uh, space, as almost as if some kind of limited uh, functionality was the ultimate state of, of efficiency of, of uh, that kind of managerial practice. Um, lastly, uh, uh, we also kind of try to build one of those uh, furniture pieces from this virtual office and kind of bring it to, to IRL, to real life, and, and really see how it works. So this was like a prototype for a flexible working uh, desk uh, designed to be kind of low cost and high speed solution to the question of kind of flexible workforce organization in architectural practice. Um, it's important to note that uh, this was not designed in Rhino and it was really just all compiled uh, out of online shopping uh, uh, carts throughout all kinds of like in industrial material providers in Michigan and, and, and beyond. So in a way it was also kind of a way to investigate the, the architecture of ready-mades and all kinds of like weird uh, supply chains that are available uh, due to presence of some kind of industry uh, there. So, and this is my last slide, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, say that I think quite often when we talk about fellowships and projects, there's some kind of uh, expectation of the outcome, right? So how do you really make a difference? How do you really kind of resist things? And how do you, what, what new things are you proposing? And I think at least in my case, I would like to say that I felt that I did not want to fall into some kind of trap of being urged to propose things or to, come up with some kind of impulsive, maybe sensationalist ad hoc solutions to large structural problems. But in a way, maybe just try to start and use this one year uh, to just try to kind of get a sense of that. Uh, and yes, maybe this is kind of not efficient and maybe this is wasteful, but I felt that um, it kind of gave me more, uh, uh, more than I would probably get if I tried to immediately jump to some kind of more concrete, I don't know, rethinking business plans and so on. So to conclude, I would just say that I think my main takeaway from the fellowship is to really kind of uh, try to make things that do not make necessarily sense. And because I think whenever you do a project and it doesn't make sense, I think that's when it gets interesting because it indicates that there's some kind of uh, friction against reality. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Manis. Um, Erin, I think you're up. Yes, I am. Um, Eduardo Medeiro um, was the 2019-2020 Fishman Fellow at the University of Michigan, where he is currently a lecturer and founder of Hangar. 
Um, Mediero holds a Master of Architecture from the Polytechnic University of Madrid and a Master of Architecture from Harvard University. Um, so welcome, Eduardo. Uh, thanks, Erin. Uh, let me share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yep, great. Super. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to um, Cal and Katie for the invitation and UVA for, for hosting. Um, my name is uh, Eduardo Medieron, as Erin was just mentioned. I'm a lecturer of architecture at the University of Michigan and the director of Hangar, a 10 year long architectural corporation committed to the decommodification of architecture and the built environment through alternative modes of ownership and finance. Um, I was also one of the fellows at Michigan alongside Mattis, who just uh, presented, and Jacob Comerci, who presented a few weeks ago. I think it's interesting that I'm presenting right after Mattis, so uh, that will hopefully give a sort of bigger picture uh, of our sort of collective endeavor and the work that we um, all did. And as Mattis explained, the Jacob Comerci himself and I worked collectively in the ideation and design of a conjunct fellowship exhibition and symposium titled Practice Product Protocol, which was um, in itself already quite uh, special because it was it's uncommon for fellows in Michigan to sort of work together towards one cohesive uh, piece of work. Um, probably the last time that happened was when uh, team were fellows, when um, uh, Meredith and Russellin and um, Ellie were, were fellows. Um, anyways, the this exhibition, what it did was materialize our common interests, interests in architecture's entanglements with immaterial systems, um, data, protocols, uh, financial instruments, and so on. Uh, structures that we believed that the discourse of our profession tends to give its back on, and that we also believe there were sort of integral aspects of the practice of architecture. Um, and I'd say that the work not only evidenced these systems, but also critically questioned architecture's reliance and dependence on them, right? Um, the, there was a point in the semester that we uh, were felt the crunch probably at the end of the fall semester of having to figure out what our individual pieces of work were going to focus, be focused on or, or um, and I sort of used the uh, excuse of having to write a piece or um, submitting a piece to Pigeon, the student-led publication at Princeton, as a way of forcing myself to sort of sit down and figure out what is that I um, wanted to, um, to explore during my fellowship year. And for the past few years, I've been exploring the physical repercussions of um, the, the notion of private property, <clears throat> sorry, has had in our built environment and especially in architecture. Understanding private property uh, as an ideological construction and exploring the, the extent of its influence in order to uh, challenge it. So when looking at our cities and the reliance of the idea of property has had in, the, in our built environments, the mere notion of the urban must be brought into question. And it was interesting because as the Fishman Fellow, uh, I, was, I was the only fellow at the University of Michigan who in their, in their call for the fellowship was asked of the work was uh, had to be focused on urban issues. So already um, questioning the urban as the first fisherman fellow uh, was already itself a statement, I, I believe. My position towards the urban uh, as the abstraction of processes of efficiency is one that acknowledges its capability for economic profit as the sole reason for its existence in, in which the notion of course of private property plays a critical role. Um, and this was the main argument of this piece that I wrote uh, which I titled Non-Herbs, pretty much embracing everything that was not urban, right? Um, I was interested in exploring also how since the rise of neoliberalism in the 1980s and the subsequent deregulation and privatization of capital markets, uh, we have witnessed a story in thirst for uh, capital accumulation and the last few decades of financial capitalism has generated new unprecedented immaterial assets that have challenged the ability of property laws to establish clear boundaries. Uh, the real estate market, which used to be composed of lands, buildings, and objects, has now been replaced by bonds, derivatives, and stocks, sets of goods that are not only unperceivable, but also limitless, an infinite financial structure that is able to accommodate the never-ending hyperaccumulation that our neoliberal economies are generating. 
And while many will define the urban condition as the circulation of services, goods, and people through, let's say, a formless network of roads, rails, and pipes, um, today, with the financialization of the built environments, circulation acquires a substantial different meaning, and it is now um, capital in the form of financial instruments, what is being circulated, what is being sort of moved around. However, um, real estate um, as an immovable good is historically speaking the quintessential illiquid asset, right? It takes enormous amount of time and efforts for architecture to be designed, approved, built, and finally sold until, until you get your profit back, right? So the financialization of the built environment uh, overcame this limitation through the manufacturing of financial instruments that provided the high degree of liquidity and speed that our global economies were craving. Financial instruments such as really real estate investment trusts or subprime mortgages operated as intermediaries for property ownership, increasing liquidity through the design of the built environment itself and through the production of what I sort of call physical financial formations or put into the words physical forms that derive from profit-driven economic uh, logics. So following the motto of um, form follows finance, the work at the exhibition appropriated such methodology in order to subvert it and criticize it. Uh, the work was composed of a, the aggregation of a series of financial alternative financial formations three of which I will be explaining today. And these provocations departed from the conventions of contemporary financial instruments and offered an alternative post-property scenario in which the circulation of capital was rendered irrelevant. Credit swaps, uh, synthetic library debt obligations, alternative derivatives, and so on, were put into use through what could be considered hyperbolic realities that evidence the deficiencies of a system in service of profit and exploitation. So some of these um, financial formations, the, the first one being the exhibition apartments. Uh, the exhibition apartments are classic, it's a classical spatial pro product of real estate, right? We, we may have been in an exhibition apartment at some point in our lives, almost like a one-to-one -one model of the potential apartment that we're gonna buy in, right? Allows buyers to imagine themselves in the physical space while permitting developers initial minimal investment. And this first financial formation departs from the use of credit swaps to create a shared ownership scheme in which the asset is infinitely swapped to constantly increase its value. The excess of capital was, is then extracted into a co-op that runs the entire structure. And the project takes the penthouse apartment as the one and only residential unit of the project, a unit to be collectively owned, but never occupied. The stock uh, interchange, uh, another of these financial formations, uh, was the most ubiquitous representation of the abstract circulatory decree of the market. This financial formation um, subverts the conventional trade services of stock exchange buildings to create a closed system of CDOs or collateral debt obligations that are constantly repackaged and introduced back into the system. The material results uh, was a centralized network that contained all the physical infrastructure to hold itself along with a sort of a grandiose hall, trade hall that was no longer sort of needed. And these complex um, abstract systems were both represented through a series of diagrams and architectural sections that could exemplify the possibility of translating these immaterial presences into a sort of quantifiable and measurable um, medium. And uh, lastly, the, uh, the another financial formation that, that came up in the exhibition was the advertising office, which based its existence in the reciprocal income of capital through self-promotion. And a series of time-based bonds were literally stacked on top of each other to shield the shares from the volatility of the markets. And these bonds were materialized into a vertical office structure uh, that was able to generate profit by simply advertising itself. Moreover, along with this piece of work, I used half of my fellowship budgets to create a call for proposals that could burn up the discussion that challenged the contemporary claim of private property over architecture and that asked to imagine the design of the design possibilities that its, its elimination could provide. And eight architecture practices were invited uh, from various places, Mexico, Colombia, Norway, and also the US. And the participants were mailed a short essay and a brief that asked them to consider the manual property uh, or also called public domain 
as a trigger for alternative modes of uh, cohabitation in a possible urban environment. And the proposals were asked to um, consider the design of a single room, a room that was not to be understood as a sort of domestic space, but more of a crop of a larger system in which the appropriation of architecture through private property was superseded by inalienable communal protocols. And the proposals were materialized and built uh, at Tamman College um, in a series of 18 by 18 inch uh, wide uh, uh, physical models that were also included and alongside the alongside the fellows sort of uh, work. And I have to also thank an amazing team of people with whom this work would have not definitely been possible. And I there's here some of the proposals the 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 um, the, the participants submitted. I won't go and explaining all of all of them, but um, um, highlight uh, sort of the varied uh, responses of the of the architects to one sort of the same given brief. Um, Prior sites two point sort of uh, suburban sonography to Christina Lucci's Earth Room, uh, Luis Callejas Observatories, Matilde Casani's Hyperbreeze Locker, and so on and so forth. And finally, alongside with the, uh, yeah, literally last slide, <laughs> the, uh, uh, alongside the physical models, um, the, the participants were asked to also um, submit a, a piece, a text, uh, which varied in format and forms, some uh, wrote poems, some wrote manifestos, and I think this one by uh, Luis Callejas and Charlotte Hansen was a little sort of letter which uh, was complemented in a series of pamphlets that, of course, no one was able to grab because the exhibition closed uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and anyways, that is, that is it. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Eduardo. Um, so next up, we have Amelin Ng. Um, and Amelin, is the 2019 20 to 2021 Worthman Fellow at Rice University. Um, she holds a Bachelor of, en of Environments at the, and a Master of Architecture from Melbourne University and a Master of Science in Critical, Curatorial and Conceptual Practices from Columbia University. Please welcome Amelin Ng. Thank you um, for that kind introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Can you, uh, can you see it full screen? Excellent. No, not, not quite yet. Um, wait, hold on. Not quite full screen as yet. Oh, okay. Let's see. And now? There we go, perfect. Fabulous. Okay, great. So I'm gonna keep this rapid. Um, so hi, I'm Emily Ng, uh, Wortham Fellow here at Rice Architecture in Houston, along with my colleague, um, Viola Ego, who I believe is here and presented earlier um, in, the, in the sessions. Firstly, many thanks to Katie and Kyle for linking us all together and hosting a fantastic series of events. Um, I'd also like to express my deep appreciation to the Rice faculty and students for their generosity and support of this research and pedagogy. So um, I would say the fellowship is teaching focused. Um, uh, with three undergraduate courses uh, a year, over two years, um, plus fellowship research that could take any format. While this may ind indicate a kind of typical two-year plan, my, my own Gantt chart uh, ended up looking a bit like this. Um, note the COVID reality in red tapering off in a hopeful fade, uh, and the red line marks where we are now. So as fellows, we were treated as full-time faculty and were included in service activities. And so I found the two-year duration kind of really critical in being able to pursue kind of overlapping windows of work here, pedagogy, publication, thesis advising, conference grants, and participating in the life of the school, such as our upcoming lecture series, New Proximities. My fellowship research came under the rubric uh, of information richness. So this term tends to conjure a purely kind of technical imaginary of smarter technologies, higher resolution, more data, such as the internet of things catch cry. But how do I demystify this blue sky, green grass worldview? To ask, me, to, to ask what makes something information rich is um, not to dichotomize objects into binaries, but rather consider kind of object systems with material dispositions and socio-technical leverage uh, and interplay Keller Easterling once called medium design. So, what we broadly, broadly call the digital uh, abstract representations are real actors in the world. 
my recent fascination, uh, BIM, Building Information Modeling, uh, is not just a symbolic drawing tool, but a 7D modeling ethic um, that automatically generates reports, detects clashes, um, and coordinates global teams. So the, this kind of collaborative global medium enmeshes many coordination labors together in a single uh, model, rendering buildings through uh, post banham kind of labyrinthian aesthetics, a system's realism with the aim of managing um, a building's entire life. BIM has been found in Palladian galleries, entering debates on aesthetics and informatic authorship. And virtual objects now represent real products. They contain manufacturer's data um, and they simulate real-time construction sequences. So in other words, architectural visualization has gone from depicting, kind of on the left with a drawing and a model, uh, to uh, simulating at, or to predicting, which is the 4D virtual construction on the right. So all this to say that this is basically the desktop view of my first fellowship year, where I was more publication focused in establishing discourse on architecture's information rich media. Uh, this work has its, found its way into Platt and the Journal of Arch Architectural Education, expanded at the Shenzhen Biennale, uh, software as infrastructure symposium and turned into an EFLUX piece called uh, 7D Vision. I made a kind of logistical poem for OSU's fulfilled exhibition and began thinking on climate exigencies and ethics in Avery Shorts and power infrastructure in America. Um, again, the fellowship's generous timing allowed such writing, which is never usually a linear uh, process uh, to unfold. Also the, the title of my topic seminar, Information Richness, investigated on-site and off-site systems in the space of the city itself. And so information richness is not purely a digital force. Uh, data centers, cemetery real estate, art storage, extraterritorial ports, uh, and, and we invested them with questions of labor, equity, ecology, and future publics. So considering the interplay between artifact, furniture, architecture, and infrastructure, uh, this led to a studio called Data Space. It's kind of a thesis senior studio uh, where students propose a range of object systems for New York City. Uh, for example, a chronological green burial building, an emergency food production landscape, a gig art hand handlers union, a port terminal workers hotel, um, a just transition towards community solar production, uh, and so on. On our first, uh, on our studio trip just before COVID, uh, we visited a range of offsite spaces and systems that kept New York City running. So from the uh, salt shed to the recycling facilities. Um, and I think it's just kind of trying to think through mediating on-site on and off-site infrastructures that are very much concrete and not just immaterial um, and invested in questions of bodies, maintenance, and labor. So if that was my first year, uh, my second year kind of blurred into something more like format finding, which is about rethinking typologies and their mediating qualities of property, power, and organization. My current studio uh, sequence, Decentering Type, began with research scrolls exploring kind of default settings in a typology, be it organizational uh, elements or spatial products. And now students are working on making proposals uh, for alternative hybrid uh, typologies, economies, protocols, and more equitable publics for Houston, Texas. I also had the pleasure of advising two fabulous uh, graduate thesis students for, uh, who looked at serial in, uh, intervention and reinvention from Alex Ertzel's fast food counter franchise towards a burgerscape of workers' cooperative power to Claire Wagner's reclaiming of vacant school types in Chicago and situating the role of the public architect as local partnership. And these were really productive conversations we had over the last year. Um, I also taught a sophomore studio last fall called Full House, proposing renovations for Talento Bilingue de Houston. So in our ongoing conversations with Mecca, the nonprofit organization, we learned about the importance of their existing infrastructure uh, in the second ward community and opted not to design an entirely new building, but rather to propose alterations and additions over time from the scale of a skylight or a storage poche to a back wall opening or performative fabric dividers to a public art armature and flexible pavilions in the parking lot and the bayou. An analog form of medium design, this incremental approach may potentially be more amenable to fundraising processes, um, allow an institution to remain operational and acknowledge the cultural and social capital accrued on a site over years uh, long before an architect would step on the scene. And so at the end of a Zoom intensive fall, projects were publicly exhibited inside the theater with hopes to engage uh, Mecca's community about the building's future. And um, this will be uh, elaborated in a future article for Site Digital with um, thanks to Jack Murphy.
So the fellowship while teaching focus has also been an installation testing ground. Screen space is a pop-up installation uh, pavilion for collective weather watching at Jury Hall. Uh, with thanks to Rice students, Carrie uh, Lee, Katie Gullick, Jane Van Velden, and pre-COVID sewing team, Kelly Yu, Emma Foster, Amy Chang. Conflating medium, shelter, and image, it reinterprets James Terrell's uh, sky space, which is also on Rice campus, for Houston's ever-changing storm-prone sky. Um, in sky space, the sky is abstracted such that even Photoshop's AI-powered sky replacement tool doesn't quite recognize it. And so over the long COVID summer, as untended grass patched the pavilion outside, it became clear that nature's pristine image is a matter of effortful maintenance. Houston is in fact a city on the lookout for hurricanes and not just by natural eye. Whether watching at NOAA's National Hurricane Centers are after all a 24 hour media, uh, multimedia affair. And so perhaps this calls for a new kind of climate aesthetics. The new architectural proportion, the 16 by nine aspect ratio regulates a large black blackout curtain fabric cloud suspended overhead for um, uh, projection. Below nature is texture mapped one to one onto grassy recliners, creating an indoor plug and play lounge for Houston broadcasts. Um, sunrise and sunset screenings comprise five channels of looped satellite footage and royalty free HD sky spliced with local weather reports and infrared imagery of Houston's hurricanes. And so this strange architectural parody does a double take on Terrell, whose timeless sky represents an earlier relationship to nature, i.e. mastery by design. And instead of an immaculate view out there, this odd pop-up, which you know is kind of uh, abandoned because of COVID, but um, I'm glad it's, it's up nevertheless, uh, is a leaky textural space permeable to both screensavers and bad weather. Um, and in all honesty, this piece on skies and screens was originally supposed to be a performance. Upon discovering that Jury Hall is roughly the same size as the Terrell Void, I asked to intervene the Twilight Epiphany sky space itself. For one night, I would mask the sky with fabric and host a screening of Houston's past hurricanes. It was rejected by the patrons on the grounds that any modification defied the artist's legal agreement. Um, and then so I embarked on this kind of world map plotting the global distribution of extant sky spaces, many of which ironically fall along the hurricane belt. And I shout out to Carrie Lee here. And so began a final scroll of thought to find new typologies for a rapidly changing post Turellian climate, so to speak. Uh, for some, for example, some temporary canopies for seasonal gathering and polychromic projection along Galveston Island, Texas, which is a storm prone stretch. On a very different typological register, uh, stay at home stress was a grant by Rice's COVID research fund um, just completed over the fall. I'd like to acknowledge Gabriel Vegara as survey co-designer and Rice student team, Carrie Lee and Carolyn Francis. Working with the Center for Urban Transformation, which provides community development um, and gap filling services in Houston's fifth ward, the pilot survey conducted qualitative interviews with 16 volunteer residents uh, on their top household concerns through Harris County's uh, lockdown or stay at home order. We were looking for a kind of visual format to spatially describe pandemic experiences beyond purely numerical or written accounts. And so through a spatial survey of de-identified house plans, it became important not just to visualize environmental and social stresses explained to us in the interviews, um, such as indoor heat stress or the need to socially distance at home, but also moments of resilience, such as shaded porches becoming important outdoor rooms and essential workers sharing a closed network of living rooms for family nights through the pandemic. Uh, the qualitative findings, uh, print version forthcoming, have since been returned to the CUT and hopes to shift the pandemic gaze from economic indices to lived space to that thick and precarious line between resilience and vulnerability under the crisis. Um, so going back to this kind of worksheet, looking ahead, there's, there's still work to be done this spring as the fellowship uh, comes to a close and with luck COVID, um, ongoing writing, uh, uneven runoff, uh, which is a rice grant mapping industrial typologies and floodplain neighborhoods with collaborators, Ray Atkinson, Mike Wisner and Kevin Smiley and most recently roped into my BIM mania, Yun Ku and Alec Burren. Uh, so it's hard to make a conclusive remark when you're still in the thick of things, but I can say it's been a real privilege engaging this cast of, of collaborators. Uh, and final thanks reserved to Rice Architecture Faculty, Dean and staff for supporting this multi-format practice. Uh, thanks and look forward to the conversation. 
Great. Thank you so much, Amelin. Um, our last presenter is Hans Tursak. Hans is the 2018 to 2021 uh, Pietro Belushi Research Fellow at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Tursak previously held the Willard A. Oberdick Fellowship at the University of Michigan. Um, and he also holds a Bachelor of Fine Art from the Cooper Union and a Master of Architecture from Princeton University. And can you all see that at full screen? Okay, cool. Um, thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Katie and Kyle, for the generous invitation to be a part of this series. I'm definitely feeling like the art school dilettante kind of outlier in the group of this sort of fascinating aggregation of research projects. Um, I'll, you know, please cut me off if I go over 10, but I think I can do this in 10. Um, I did want to show a few projects in a thematic series, not just my fellowship. Um, and it sort of began with the summer before my first appointment as the Oberdick Fellow at the University of Michigan, where I did the kind of blue-green house in the center of the slide. Um, it's the first in a series of houses that I started after graduating from my MARC program. Um, and I have a fantasy of compiling these in a kind of uh, theoretical treatise someday, hence the kind of publication references there. Um, so at Michigan, I, I really began to build what I now understand as a fairly coherent research project on architectural color, animation, generative compositional systems, um, by first redrawing this project when I got there, and then beginning the series in earnest with my fellowship project. So the early houses all kind of pirate a perceptual discourse that comes from minimalist sculpture. This is the work and it's a diagram by um, the painter, sculpture, hybrid, and Truett, um, as well as the architectural neo-avant-garde in the US. And the ideas that I was and still am borrowing from both of those historical moments in art and architecture are an interest in a kind of phenomenological reading of geometric structures, both sculptural and, and uh, architectural, and specifically an interest, um, well, a related interest, I should say, in Gestalt theory as it's applied to um, the readings of architectural elevations like graphic datums. So I was really interested in painting sculpture hybrids like Truett's um, uh, work, and then architects and theorists who built sort of elaborate conceptual um, tools to talk about analogies between painterly spaces and architectural surfaces. And at some point uh, at Michigan, I started doing these path animations, really simple. Um, but as, as the camera sort of moves around the object, for me, it was a way of simulating the kind of mobile eye of the viewer studying architectural surfaces in the round. And I really wanted these first houses to read as opaque boxes or almost like architecturally scaled and Truett cubes, or at least the way that a certain brand of kind of phenomenologically formalist uh, inclined critics talk about reading her work in the round. So when I exhibit any of the houses, I always attempt a kind of modest fabrication and material experiment in the hopes of building some of these projects or at least elements from them in the future. These are kind of decorative interior elevation panels from my desert house from Michigan. And then the final images for the exhibition, the prints were presented with other furniture scale objects in, in the gallery. Um, in inside of illuminated light boxes, which was a kind of like analog, you know, nod to the digital screen. And so in a bunch of these houses, I started constructing these little object worlds in plan or video game like environments um, as their imagined sites. And some of that work is now informing a series of advanced studios that I'm teaching at the Rhode Island School of Design on world building with animation software. And so permit me a little digression here. Um, this is one of my students from RISD, uh, Tian Bao Hu, but you can see the connection through the plan graphics and the kind of micro campuses of objects, even though it's at an urban scale now. Um, and then the other common denominator is that the plans are in a quasi staged uh, chance based operation. So the animations are getting more sophisticated, but the visual ideas are were in the houses. And then as the Belusky Fellow at MIT, I designed a third house in the series. Um, with this house, really a pavilion, there's no furniture. Um, there's more of an interest in transparency, working with a kit of parts, legible tectonics, and an aesthetics of industrial design more so than the previous two. And with that kind of simple shift from opacity to transparency, to dumb architectural idea, um, and a more developed tectonic language, 
I started looking at more semantically kind of polluted geometric art. Um, it's always geometric art is always the source material for me. But if before the key references were phenomenological purists, like high modernists, basically like Ann Truitt, I began to look at the so-called neo-geometric art of the 1980s, which is kind of a weird outcropping from, from late modernism. So figures like Sherry Levine, Peter Halley, Ashley Vickerton, and Haim Steinbach. Um, in that work, you see a similar minimalist geometric language. Sometimes it looks like high modernism or minimalism, but it's shot through with industrial design detailing, commercial objects, allusions to science fiction. Um, so it's geometric abstraction, but now like filled to the brim with cultural references. It doesn't exist in a kind of perceptual vacuum anymore. So fortunately with the um, uh, MIT fellowship, I had the opportunity this round to work with a fabrication studio in Long Island City called Substrate Fabrication. And Substrate milled the components for the light boxes and the vitrines out of this beautiful material called Velcromat. And then they sprayed the parts with an automotive enamel to kind of match the renderings that I had given them. So there was this nice physical virtual kind of play. And both the design of the house and the installation details, again, borrowed heavily from Ashley Bickerton's kind of sculptures, um, his early sculptures, especially. And then, you know, as you can probably tell, certain high tech architectural expressionists like early Neil Denari and certainly um, people like, you know, um, Amla Mushang Hopkins, I believe, from the kind of British high tech set. Being a school in a kind of dense urban setting, which I love, um, <laughs> comes with certain drawbacks. MIT space and fabrication capabilities are pretty limited, um, not for long, it's gonna change soon, but they are at the moment. So more than ever, this was a project that needed to be like excessively modeled at the beginning of the process and designed for simple assembly with basic tools by myself without a team, it was just out of my budget. I love working with students, but I couldn't in this case. So I was able to quickly put all of this together in a few days when the parts arrived, rather than counting on something like, you know, craft or shop craft, I really focused on digital craft. Um, so this installation itself was a kit. Um, the parts came from Substrate, and then um, there's kind of like run of the mill hardware from like MasterCard that stitches it all together. And so if my first two houses were about opacity and surface games and the elevation as a painterly, da painterly datum, I really wanted this project to work as a kind of x-ray cube, more like a stylized piece of infrastructure, which serves as a theater or a frame for objects within rather than an object in and of itself. Again, things like the Bickerton boxes and Haim Steinbeck's um, sort of triangular shelves figured heavily in my thinking about the installation. But then at the same time, as an instructor, I developed a seminar at MIT that I called Precarious Structures, and I've run it a couple of times now. Um, in the seminar, I had students study precedents from post-minimal sculpture, so people like Joel Shapiro, that forefront assemblages and kind of collage sculptures that are in the process of kind of coming undone or are otherwise kind of tectonically unstable. And so these are animations from that seminar. This is um, students Nada Amula and Jason Kim. I should have labeled the slides. Sorry, guys. Um, and for me, this is where my interest in three-dimensional theories of color, assembly systems, time-based strategies, and post-war sculptural issues like the formless kind of all came together. So my student work was ahead of my personal work, I felt like, <laughs> um, as, as students are often prone to do. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, I'm going to close with uh, two house projects and a sculpture that are in progress right now. Um, and I'll ask for your generosity again. These are little more than drawings at the moment. Ideally, I'll be making models and prototypes this summer. Um, I did these in a sequence, uh, so you'll see them chronologically. The first one, this house was for a timed weekend long competition, so very, very fast. Um, and in these last projects, I'm beginning to synthesize the work that I'm exploring in my teaching with my earlier interests in post-war formalism and color theory. I hope my Zoom controls aren't in the way. Um, so this was a house that I designed last winter at MIT and presented at Rice for Viola Agos Symposium on Compositional Physics. And in this project, the structure is more or less a neutral frame for the frozen animation of objects within. Again, you know, the house is a frame for a theater of objects. Um, I also play up this element of kind of visual precarity or a staged choreographed precar precarity by tethering large sculptural pieces to the roof. So the blue weight 
anchored at the bottom um, on a pulley on the roof system is, is sort of holding up this kit apart spine that's skewering the floor plates at an angle. And for me, the, the obvious reference, I think it's obvious, um, is John Hayduck's late work, Cathedral, certainly that cylinder kind of crashing through the envelope. And then um, maybe more of a visual rhyme, um, Preston Scott Kellen's i beam competition from 2001. Um, the visual rhyme are the volumes kind of um, cascading through the floor plates and the envelope. And then um, last house, uh, this is a house that I designed while I was in residence at OMI last year. Most of my projects happen as fellowships or residencies. Um, this was in Ghent, New York, just moments before the lockdown. So it's also unfinished. Um, but you can see that I'm starting to become a little bit more ambitious with the color scheme and how I distribute colors in space, let's say. Um, and the formal diagram, like the previous project, was uh, triggered by some quick Maya sketches that I'm using now in my practice to, to sort of loosen up um, some of the earlier, more orthographic, super formal uh, cube, cube house stuff. So for me, the simulations, the Maya simulations, create these happy accidents in plan and the kind of conversation between composition and anti-composition that I actually started with my MRC thesis years ago um, and have been exploring in a more uh, explicit way with my MIT seminars. So again, the houses are catching up to my teaching experiments or catching up to my students. Um, the animations also happily introduce new problems in section, again, getting away from like the orthographic cube kind of um, neo-avant-garde language that I was playing with. I can break the cube now with a kind of collage of volumes within a controlled architectural frame. And so when I presented this uh, first house at Rice for Viola's conference, um, I wrote a short talk arguing that the use of animation in contemporary experimental, you know, i.e. academic um, design practices is really a reimagining of the post-minimal use of process in art. They both share an interest in creating kind of irrational machines for the production of form. And so last, last couple of slides. Um, these are sketches for a sculpture that I'll be building this spring and summer on the MIT campus. Um, it's going to be one sculpture. These are early sketches. On the left are kind of chromatic iterations that my research assistant, John Brearley, wrote a script for over the summer so we could cycle through palettes really quickly in V-Ray and Rhino. And then with the help of the 3M vinyl wrapping division, we're hoping to make a custom um, automotive wrap for the piece uh, to create the graphic. Um, these are actually old images um, with apologies to my research assistant. I keep iterating. Um, the color has since changed. Um, and then again, like the Belusky Fellowship, the game, which is partially motivated by COVID, partially motivated by the particular circumstances at MIT, will be to make the project using primarily things like 80-20 components, McMaster car hardware, and then um, working with Substrate again in Long Island City to digitally fabricate this as a kit of parts and just kind of put it together with, with simple hand tools. Um, and I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Um, thank you all. And uh, quite a lot of, of material for us to, to get through and sift through, Erin. Um, <laughs> I, 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 um, I'm first struck by the, the whole kind of premise of these, these presentations in general. Um, a friend of mine pointed out that he had no idea there were th this many fellowships in architecture. Um, uh, and it's it, just the number of fellowships that exist is, is quite, quite radical. And um, the, the reality that these are kind of incubator incubator beds for for faculty um, that continue on to tenure and tenure track positions um, is is quite fascinating as well um, so we can start to imagine the kinds of, of trajectories and and um, and careers that come out of this um, uh, so I I mean I, I might try to tie a few of these things together but mm -hmm. I don't know if you had some other initial responses yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking that the, I mean, particularly because most of these fellowships in architecture seem to be teaching fellowships, um, how much, uh, and I think everybody touched in different ways on the way that 
uh, and to very various degrees on the way that the sort of um, pedagogical approach uh, dovetails in or at times doesn't, or at times it steps ahead of um, what we might consider practice. Um, but I, I was particularly struck by something that Mena said in the first in the first presentation, which was um, uh, her interest in um, the more emotional forms of uh, practice, which uh, for um, for as far as I know, things that fall into the emotional category or feeling or subjectivity are typically pushed out of what might be considered um, uh, various forms of like uh, mm, transmittable expertise or, yeah. or knowledge that's instilled in a kind of professional degree program. And so I am super interested in the kind of um, ways that we need to make space for that form of um, intellectual uh, recognizing it as a form of intellectual um, work uh, in in the field of architecture. I think it's not just that architects need to be more emotionally connected to work, but that um, seeing expertise as something that's um, not perhaps and definitely not um, codified in what we would consider the discipline, but that comes um, from other sources. And I, I think that that, um, that push and the ways that um, Mena made kind of space for um, <clears throat> these forms of practice, uh, uh, I thought was most articulated obviously in the first presentation, but uh, similar questions were being asked throughout, um, like, what, like what role does the drawing have? How do we materialize things that are typically seen to, to be immaterial or how does architecture begin to engage in, um, let's say, practices or fields that are not necessarily considered architecture, but are they considered more in the realm of engineering or um, uh, sort of information aesthetics or like information generating or the sort of managerial aspects of things. And I, I thought that that was a kind of really pr provocative way to start the evening and threads picked up through each of the kind of yeah. presentations. I thought, um, yeah, I think, I think um, what Mena said definitely struck a chord with, with, with many of us, you know, talking about the emotional aspects of design. And um, in, in a way, once we got to the, to the last presentation by Hans, I felt like it was almost like a, a, a polarity of, of something that um, uh, 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 an interest, a research interest that I would think about for, for in Mena's case, which I would call radical um, contingency. It's like, it's really based in a very specific locale and a very specific um, set of, set of, um, of contingent uh, realities. Um, and then Hans, is definitely um, focused in the in in a kind of radical autonomy of of object, right? So there there's a kind of investment in the thing and in um, the the color of the thing, the texture of the thing, the fabrication of the thing. Um, and I thought, and and we could kind of create a gradient across each of these um, between the kind of radical edges of contingency and and autonomy. Um, but I also thought that there was, if there's one thing that might connect them all, it's, it's a, I, I thought each was interested in, in bringing to the forefront um, uh, issues that aren't talked about quite off, very often in, in architecture at all, or in architectural education. So, you know, um, finance is something that is, is almost never talked about in architectural ed education. Or, um, or practice, ironically, you know, like just the, 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 the mundane logistics of running a really efficient practice, um, these things aren't really talked about, as, especially not in studio classes, maybe in one small module in your professional practice class course, um, or, or um, climatology, you know, or, or um, things like that aren't, aren't often discussed 
um, in depth in the discourse or in the in 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 academic. So I think um, I, I really applaud each of them for for bringing um, these these critical issues into their practice, into their research, and into their teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I wondered if if um, if there were uh, maybe some um, some more nuance overlaps. You know, I thought that it, obviously the work that that Montes and Eduardo are doing are, are definitely related because they're under a similar heading or they're in the uh, um, a similar uh, a research um, space at at the University of Michigan, but. Um, you know, I, I I think you know connecting some of the, the 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 thoughts on the reflections on on BIM from Mattis's presentation to the reflections on BIM um, in a kind of different trajectory in in Amelin's presentation, I thought was was quite fascinating. And then um, thinking that the um, as different as as Hans and and Mena's presentations were, they're both using the house as this this place for 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 investigation so you know the house seems to always show up in architectural education as this this primary locus for for investigation mm -hmm. definitely and I was I mean I was also struck by the sort of um, sub subjects that everybody was exploring I mean um, uh, Mena, you talked a bit about um, the the sort of detail as another form of uh, or another site of um, let's say work that's not that's perhaps more emo emotional as you might say or involves a different form of labor um, and um, knowledge than we typically think of as um, architectural um, to, to begin to sort of open up other conversations. And I, I think that um, Hans, you're thinking about similar things, but in different ways. And I, I mean, given the references that you have in the beginning, particularly with Anne Truitt um, and the amount of labor that her work involves to actually like not have a detail. I mean, same with John McCracken. And I imagine a lot of people that you might be looking at the sort of um, detail as detail in a way. And then for um, a lot of your work to really rely on um, almost the ex expression of uh, like the visible evidence of the details and the labor that goes into it because of the ways that you're working and like the sites of design that you're kind of working within, whether it's in the digital space and you're working with um, uh, companies to prefabricate parts that you can assemble as a kind of kit with off the shelf things from McMaster um, or really just thinking through um, like what a, how a detail even like registers in a physics engine in order to build it as a physical thing. Um, in, in the real world. I mean, I think that um, the, the terms are similar across a lot of the research projects, but I think they mean very, very different things yeah. um, for everyone. And I think that the sort of specificity of each of these terms is where um, we begin to produce expertise and, and knowledge in really kind of compelling and, and interesting ways. Um, it, would, it would be great to hear how I mean, maybe just jumping off that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the other thing I really appreciated, Mena, I mean, maybe I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's just because um, you were first or what, but I, I also really appreciated the way that you referred to um, um, the people that you were kind of doing work for as customers as opposed to clients, sure. um, which I, I thought was a kind of interesting um, counter to uh, maybe some of the things that Matisse was bringing up about the sort of managerial practice that we like the sort of managerial trajectory of architecture um, right now, like that one way to one way to think about it is that we're um, and, and Mark Wigley actually wrote a kind of amazing essay called like architecture of content management, 
um, that we're architects are just getting increasingly good at like um, managing a whole lot of stuff and that stuff is already out there and that it begins to really shift the way we think about um, design in a way and like design for who and how do we begin to um, kind of situate ourselves um, in the world. Yeah, maybe even a, a counter to Eduardo's um, idea of of um, of uh, the 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 unherb or the um, that that the, that we're kind of divorcing um, divorcing property from 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 ownership, right? And what does that do to the the urban environment? How do we we change that? That that's almost a completely counter counter um, idea to. The idea of a client as a as a customer, um, but maybe to 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 bring the fellows into the conversation, I thought it was really quite telling when Matis opened up and said, you know, he would have had he seen the first presentation, he would may maybe have changed his his um, his presentation completely to mm -hmm. make to make different points. Uh, but I wonder if maybe this is a question to to all to everyone. Um, uh, maybe Monty's first, like how, how would you maybe have, have changed or, or your presentation or, or maybe how now seeing all the other presentations, you might um, approach your research differently, your research and maybe even your teaching. Uh, probably uh, I, I could give you like a high quality answer in, in a few days. Uh, so, so I have a bit of time to digest all of this. But let's say to share a, a kind of a hot take, uh, I, I was I was the reason why the reason why I at the beginning of my presentation is is because I think that I think that there are different dimensions how, how we can evaluate and understand architectural work, and maybe and again this is going to be let's say a really hot take, but I, I will I will make a speculation that let's say there's almost like an inverse uh, proportion in terms of like what, let's say, architects traditionally think is important for them and what's, what, let's say, the kind of industry or the market uh, deems important. Uh, in, in other words, let's say, uh, spending a lot of time in, in let's say, investing, in, let's say, in the kind of emotional side of design and really thinking about about, about let's say the kind of social aspects of work and what really is the kind of impact on, 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 on people is not necessarily the same that is actually rewarded by uh, uh, kind of many clients actually, right? Or maybe trying to kind of think of some kind of high kind of theoretical framing of things. So I think that in a way, and I think it's very important to emphasize that in a way, I mean, I, I kind of showed it really from the managerial standpoint, but of course there is this whole other side of, uh, that is the kind of the, 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 the uh, the, you know, the, this kind of like a uh, uh, belief that honestly, I don't necessarily agree with entirely, but you know, that there is this thing that is told to many architects in the architecture school that whatever we do as architects uh, is, has this kind of almost like unconditional uh, uh, quality of improving lives, right? That whatever we do is good. Like we help, we make space, we improve things. And again, I mean, it, it shows some kind of good intentions. And of course we could question uh, if that's always true or not. Personally, I, th I don't think it's true. Uh, but I, I, but I, I think that that, that kind of uh, uh, element should definitely be a uh, kind of a uh, uh, question mark. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mena, I wanted to ask you, your, the title of your fellowship, and I know there were others that had the same design for spatial justice um, fellowship, um, in, in relation to something you said about um, the unhoused in the area being kind of really apprehensive even about the word, the term design. Um, and, and I guess I wonder if you think that there, if, it, if it's just a terminology thing or if you think that there's space in where design might be located in, um, in sort of a conversation around spatial justice or if we need to be kind of bringing in other terms or other ways of approaching. Um, I don't think it's a, the issue is that we need to bring in other terms. Um, we had a long discussion about this after we started asking questions and engaging and talking to people. And so how um, anxiety inducing the word design is to our customer. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we can discuss this customer term again. Um, 
But when we had, and we had concluded our team in the studio that it apparently in our field, we have fucked up. We have betrayed all these communities and we have been agents to all these uh, um, uh, apparatus of injustice and gentrification and financialization. And we've been really complicit within all these terms of um, injust in, in, injustice, of all these um, aspects of injustice. And we were, the, the whole fellowship around design uh, for spatial justice is based on, the, on this idea that injustice is there by design. It's not mm -hmm. that we're going there to design the counter injust injustice, the injustice itself is there by design. So we have had uh, extensive conversations about this issue, and we have decided at that time that we don't use the term and we suspend it until we go back into our practices and decolonize that term and take it away from its complete position. I don't think we need to change the term as academia is just so full of this terminology making economies for research, as you all know, um, uh, but, but somehow confront it and take it back from that uh, kind of a position of complicity. And um, we, I think, um, I think the, the result, the result coming out of it was kind was different. It did not look like the uh, architecture project that, that everybody expected it to look like. Um, it, well, it made peace with its inconsistencies and it made peace with the problems it faced. It made peace, peace with the shortage in funding. It made peace with all these things and offered the, the, um, the things that were, the, were in the imaginary of our customer. And let me just uh, raise this point here that English is my third language. So meaning goes through several avenues before it comes into English. And to me, we, um, trying to identify what we're working, we were working uh, on and with without delving into poverty porn and on the other side, having the elitist position of clientele, trying to force uh, this community to perform this clientele thing that we have in architecture. And the word customer to me has always been this um, uh, marketplace in a small village in a cyclic economy. And the architectural laborer is part of the cyclic economy in this equal position. We are not neither elitist nor we are philanthropists. We are part of this community and we want to do our role because we feel like that's that's what we are trained to do. That's what we are educated to do as a field that really claims its social project in our in the field of architecture. The the, the social project is really pronounced. Yet the, our complicity in um, anti-social projects are much more detectable, empirically detectable. Right. So so Eduardo, I wonder if you you had. Um... Uh, similar similar thoughts on on any of this because you had talked about within your model of um, of non ownership of 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 uh, of the built environment whether there was um, there might be a, a deeper political agenda or social justice agenda behind some of that um, I think you mentioned um, libertarianism at some point but maybe some of that could also be seen uh, um, as, as socialist. Um, where might some of your, your research land in, in, in that sense? Yeah, totally. Um, well, I, I think that coming from Spain, I'm um, truly convinced socialist by heart, but I, I think my, my research started um, as uh, almost as a, as, a, as a personal research through trying to understand where, how my own country had reached the, the housing crisis uh, that, and the conditions that sort of led to, to that crisis itself, right? So um, it, was through, it, was, it was through understanding that the commodification of, uh, of the built environment, and maybe more specifically of housing, um, led to that, um, to that sort of bubble and understanding of something as basic as um, 
the right to, to housing as something that could actually be exchanged and introduced into markets and, and under, be understood as, as actual assets um, was something that um, just I could not grapple with, right? That I, 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 was, I was just personally against and one can sort of understand or like intuitively know what the, where that falls in terms of ideologies. Um, so in my, in my um, for me, the, the work itself, I, I think probably um, lies there in, in, in the, um, in sort of the social repercussions that understanding um, the, the built environment is something that has an economic value and that, and that, that is um, possible because we understand it as something that we can, that we can own or we can actually put um, sort of um, ownership to um, was part of, is, is the sort of the main sort of ethos of my, of my research. So in a way, while the research, it's definitely highly political and highly ideological, uh, it sort of sums up to something extremely personal at the same time. Um, Brittany, I don't, I don't mean to call you out of the audience, but I know you had a question for Amelin, so maybe this is a good time to open, open it up for, for questions. Yeah. Brittany, did you want to? Um, sure. Yeah, I can read it. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to change the conversation, which I think was getting really interesting. Um, I just had a quick question for Amelin, um, as a fellow who's Houstonian, um, weather is one of the sort of few collective experience in the city. Um, that we sort of share as Houstonians, um, although many people experience it in, in sort of a radically sort of unequal geography. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk more about what it means to sort of take this idea of a weather report um, or the sort of the, the data sets that we get um, from uh, kind of hurricane monitoring, et, et cetera. Um, and what, like, what does it mean? What, what was your sort of compulsion or interest in, in transforming it into um, an aesthetic experience, a gallery experience. Um, that's that's basically it. Right. No. Thanks for the the question. And I think that I think it's kind of right. There, there was a. Um, I think it wasn't so much to kind of gallerize the climate experience as a as as, as um, it is to think through other postures for um, weather watching. And I don't know. I I I kind of walk past the Terrell all the time and uh, there's something striking and kind of there's kind of something about the kind of architects enlightenment impulse in, in Terrell's work where the, the where nature is a perfect object where nature is the same sunrise and sunset and it's kind of authored a uh, piece of, of of sky even though that is not how everybody understands Houston sky to be especially during hurricane season and so on and so uh, it, it was kind of I think um, a bit of a parody to to, to think about li like lying down and looking up, which is a kind of classic relaxing pose. Um, at the same time, you know, if you were in the gallery, you would listen to kind of this kind of sounds Im Im emitting from the berms uh, on which you, you kind of recline and that's the kind of weather report. Um, so it's a kind of audio experience too. And, and I think there's something um, about the kind of, I guess, technologies of attention and um, ways of seeing where you know you're looking up but then you're also simultaneously looking um, down uh, on a satellite view and things like that and ways in which um, weather is usually inscribed um, and told to us when there is something actually critical to look at um, so I, I don't know I, th I think it was something to do with by turning it into an embodied experience I think it was um, maybe to borrow Mena's Term, uh, terminology making discourses uh, phrase, which is so pervasive, I guess, in meteorology and in other ways of knowing climate, you know, kind of very technocratic approaches where I was like, well, what if we just get in a room and it's dark and we see, we, we, uh, we are actually watching uh, infrared of Harvey really slowly for 12 minutes, right? And, and, and hearing that and think, and it was meant to be a kind of collective experience, I think, to um, have multiple bodies in the room and like actually watch this kind of and, and have that discussion about about um, other ways of seeing climates. But yeah, I, I mean, I think it was kind of more uh, odd intuition of things than a kind of overly theorized. Thanks. 
So I'm seeing another question here in the chat that that's struck up a bit of a conversation um, from, from Galo um, Canizares. And uh, I wondered if, if, um, if we could use it as an opportunity to bring Hans into the conversation. Uh, because it's, so the question is about value, uh, producing value in your work. And I, and I can't help look at your work and not think about cost, right? Like the, the, the cost of fabricating the, the, the thing and um, what kind of value is, is placed on, on the, the fabrication uh, quality and techniques. And then maybe um, straddling the worlds of art and architecture, there's a whole nother layer or level of, of adding value from the art world. I, I'm, I'm just now myself understanding a little bit more about the art world and what value, how value is assigned there. So maybe you could, you have a, a different answer to this question about um, uh, the pressure to produce value in your work or where is value located in your work? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a big can of worms. Um, I, and I guess um, one that I've become more aware of how big that can is um, as, uh, working at MIT. I come from an art school background, which is more of an atelier model, you know, like the kind of like RISDs and Cyrix and Coopers. Um, and, uh, you know, at MIT and most research universities, um, value is ascribed in many different ways. Um, research, you know, research on the scientific model is value. Um, corporate collaborations can give you both academic credit and just sort of, um, you know, financial resources to do more elaborate projects. Um, the, the art world question is a tricky one. I think, I think most, I'm making sweeping generalizations here, but a lot of people who ride the art and architecture axes, um, I seem to kind of have to commit to one or the other, either you're, you know, a tenure track professor and, and having access to large grants and working with corporations to realize your projects, or you are, you are fully engaged in the, in the art world, you know, in probably New York, Los Angeles, London, or Berlin, and then you, you maybe teach on the side, um, but teaching is always something that's taking away from your practice. Um, so that's not an answer to the question. It's just, um, you know, <clears throat> learning that there are many different, many different models out there for ascribing value. Um, and again, at, at research universities, another interesting phenomenon that I didn't know exists until I started um, uh, getting deeper into the system is that um, many research universities have kind of entrepreneurial incubators, um, which is another level to go into the kind of, um, you know, and, and then of course you have to um, rebrand, repackage, um, and rethink your work as not just research, but as commodity. Um, so those are all viable avenues for particular kinds of value with varying degrees of, of um, you know, sinister qualities and drawbacks to each of them. But um, yeah, I think all of that is on the table for fellows who sometimes don't have full access to, to those uh, four or five avenues that I sketched out, but they can certainly get a flavor for them and decide, you know, is this something that I'm gonna pursue in earnest as I, as I engage with <clears throat> either tenure track searches or you know, becoming a senior lecturer and getting access to larger grants, that kind of thing. I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, I think you're muted. I think it does for sure, sorry. Um, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else wanted to tackle the, the the value question, because I think it's 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 something that we all grapple with as as architects, or maybe there are other questions from the from the audience that are pressing. I could just maybe quickly add. I mean, I think that I mean indeed, as Hans said, I think this is like a huge kind of worms when we oh that we are about to open if we're really going to fully talk about value. All I wanted to kind of say is that I think that value is kind of a really a matter of perception, right? Because there are different ways to perceive value and, and different, uh, let's say, uh, perspectives might find value in, 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 in located in, in different parts of architectural project or in a way also in a fellowship. Um, and I think that that's maybe what I try to kind of say in the end of my presentation, that in a way, you know, I think that increasingly, at least, and again, I can speak more about the European context, that 
value in kind of in general in, in cultural scene in general, including architecture and also architectural education, value is kind of uh, quantified in some kind of uh, uh, you know metrics or some kind of way that you can measure that you could put in some kind of chart that you could compare that you can you know measure the ROI for the taxpayers or for, for whoever is like you know kind of sanctioning you to do something as a designer as an architect. Um, and, and, and I think that in a way, this is one of the problems that, you know, that like, for instance, how can you measure emotional value in, in, in those terms? It's probably much more difficult, right? And, and of course, again, you could draw a chart, you could try to kind of uh, define criteria and so on, but it, it would kind of uh, be, you know, probably delivering quite uh, problematic uh, results. And I think that this is the kind of beautiful thing about the, uh, the most of the fellowships that I think we have heard about, at least in, in these uh, sessions, that that in, in a way that, that there is, of course, some kind of pressure to produce work, but let's say that it's not necessarily defined or quantified before it's produced. So in, in other words, that I think that, that fellows are, are given kind of more or less free, free hands to do something, and then maybe the value is kind of evaluated at a later stage, at least uh, this is how it seemed to be, it's, uh, in my experience at Taubman College. I have to say something on this issue, and um, excuse me for raising the Marxist uh, notion here if we're speaking about value. The issue now is raised as if it's a universal notion. There are several fields of value. There are several fields of evaluation, and and it, th just just by um, uh, just by using a pluriversal 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 lens, looking looking at um, different epistemes and different ontologies, and the problem with value here is its fixation. It's like property in whiteness. How what is created as value was accepted as value. And I understand that within our fellowships, and I'm very lucky um, to have been ex accepted into uh, this fantastic fellowship in which everybody in its leadership understands the, the, the question of indigeneity and that it's a, an epistemic problem. And so consequently, it's going to be a value problem. Um, but but I I am I'm, I'm perplexed by us talking about value as if there is one field of value or one field of meaning. Um, what I think um, what everybody is doing is um, really confronting these fields of value, especially in your work, Eduardo. I have so many questions for you, a hundred questions for you uh, on on form, especially is that this this I think uh, is the most discussed issue in architecture and in my under, in, and in my point of view, the least theorized issue in architecture and how value form um, follows financialization. And then is there a way for, I'm sorry for changing the topic. I have to ask that question. Um, is there a way for form to dismantle financialization? Is there anything we can do with that beast? Uh, because we've been working and I've been kind of trying to um, include myself in some uh, community land trusts and uh, I would love to learn more about this from you after we finish our current question. I'm sorry if were for the uh, Yeah, uh, thanks. We, um, I know you're, you're, um, you're coming to talk at Michigan uh, in a couple of weeks, and um, I know part, I'm part of the one faculty, so we'll have time to speak um, in a couple of weeks, you and I. But um, yeah, I mean, I, is there a way of tracking that? Uh, it is a tricky question, and I don't think there is a sort of a clear answer. I think that um, um, we have understood most of the time the spaces we live as spaces of, um, of economic efficiencies, places where um, they have to be designed in a particular way in order to operate within the market. And markets uh, don't, um, don't expect uh, physical spaces to be unexpected, right? There's a certain uh, sets of like rules that one must follow in order for this, um, for this space to be profitable. So at least in my work and the studios that I'm teaching at Michigan, what we try to find is um, inefficient, Forms or, in, or forms that, uh, in, in not in their sort of, not in the the forms themselves, but how we reach those forms, uh, end up um, sort of constraining the possibility for the markets to be to take them take them over or, or exploit them, right? Um, 
So I think there are, I, I want to believe there are ways and I think there are connections, right? Because the same way that you can read uh, a condominium as a financial formation, uh, uh, 501 as a financial formation, right? There's, there's actual architectural forms that can, um, that are derived from economic logics. Uh, one can sort of undo that, right? And start uh, designing space that um, tries to be as, economically inefficient as, as possible, right? Um, I don't, I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to sort of like divert the conversation somewhere else, but I, I, there's, there are possibilities there, right? And then probably in terms of, if we go back to the question of value, um, in this case, the, the question would, would revolve around the, at least eradication or challenging of the economic value of, of architecture, right? If I might jump in here just to, to kind of add to the conversation about value and, and form and how form making relates to economics and things like that, I would I would think not so much to um, form aesthetically, but form supply chains. And maybe this is a kind of also the background of like BIM and politics and how it relates what you specify it relates to a to extraction, to practices of um, 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 of labor, uh, who builds your architecture does a really amazing job of tracing like the steel trusts, right? Like to its global networks and thinking through the complicities in that way. So I feel like if like now that maybe also just thinking through the kind of uh, BIM object as a kind of site uh, that, you know, we're just clicking on these objects because they're given to us and we add them to our buildings and such, but we, we you know, they're, they're linked to manufacturers already. Um, so, you know, there are certain guaranteed manufacturing uh, things that are related to that. Um, if there's some way to rethink the kind of supply chain logic, so like at least um, um, omit those that are not, um, uh, you know, ethical, I think that there's something there. But yeah, I, I would also quite wonder if like in a certain kind of aesthetic relates to a certain kind of economic um, paradigm. I mean, I think so, yeah. And th that for me, it's also one of the most difficult um, questions to answer. And I actually have a student currently uh, uh, researching that in his studio project. And it's, it, it, is, it is a struggle because it's like so difficult to sort of uh, grasp. Um, but maybe like, uh, for what about the, the idea of like the model? I, I don't know if that's something that, um, that resonates across uh, all of our work, right? From bin models to actually housing, like house models in the work of hands or um, um, practice models or in, uh, in the work of Mathis, for example. I don't know, like there's a, this idea that there is different, um, mo sorry, <laughs> started suddenly becoming a moderator here, but like there's, uh, there's different sets of models that we've all, all been focusing on that carry different sets of information um, in our work, but we all, I think, uh, I see that as a common denominator um, across everyone's sort of research. Maybe this is a stretch. No, that's, that's I think that's a great um, summary for sure. Um, and yeah, I definitely think about financial models as well within mm -hmm. that, that realm. Um, I wonder if we have time for one last question, if anyone has one, or maybe this is where we turn it back over to Katie and Kyle to wrap it up for us. I have a question. Go ahead, Mina. Okay. Well, I honestly have a million questions for everybody, uh, but Hans, I was really fascinated because I come from that position where in the beginning it was the house, the house, within the, the steam in which I stand is not implicated in the public-private dichotomy. It's the point of origin, it's the point of birth. And I was so interested in, in how, um, it, it, how your work with the house made it so unimplicated in the public-private dichotomy. And I was interested to maybe engage with you and ask you about this, if you have you know, uh, co confronted this issue of you know, dichotomies. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, Mena. Um, I mean, it's what Mark Jarzenbeck calls the kind of like villa tradition, um, 
it's like the neoliberal fantasy, you know, of having like the little thing on the on the hill, the autonomous house on the hill. Um, I, I think what maybe sets that work out of that problematic is that I'm interested in how aesthetic objects, be they sculpture, painting, or pieces of architecture set up, you know, how they construct politics of viewing um, and, and subject object relationships. Um, now, there's a problem with that. It's usually presuming a universal subject and that universal subject is usually white and male um, and, you know, upright and a, a kind of like vertical. That's like the classical way of, of setting that problematic up. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that you brought up Sarah Ahmed um, because I was thinking we actually have maybe some weird um, crossovers in in our interest in philosophies of subjecthood in that I'm actually seeing um, a kind of resurgence of theory being written about um, emotion and subjecthood and experience, um, usually by splicing classical phenomenology with something new like media theory or queer theory. Um, um, I'm thinking of the media theorist, Carolyn L. Cain, um, or who else was I thinking of? Um, Sorry, uh, the, the, the phrase, the commod commodification of affect came up today too. And I know affect and emotion are not perfect synonyms, but I do, I do feel like there is a certain um, uh, excitement around theories of affect in talking about the way that we consume architectural objects, not necessarily ones that I designed, but maybe virtual ones. Like I was just reading a book about um, uh, Ideology in the Virtual City by John Bales. Um, and it's it's about how we consume video games and how our, our affects that are um, you know triggered in video games are are part of that commodification mechanism. Um, and so yeah, I, I mean I'm I'm not really asking answering your question um, so, so well, but I, I do think that there are strange affinities between our respective projects that I would I would love to explore more if we had more time. I would love to. It was really fascinating just looking at the house that is not implicated in, in a public-private dichotomy was really refreshing to me. And on, on the subject of time, Katie? Sure. Well, um, thank you so much. Um, I, I think we got through um, five wonderful presentations and also got some really good discussion in. Um, so uh, apologies uh, to the fellows for, for us having to be timekeepers. Um, but uh, we just wanna say thank you so much to Aaron and Seku for um, you know, unpacking this work. Uh, this evening marks the conclusion of the series. And as we wrap up, we wanna again, articulate our gratitude to the fellows for their generosity in, in putting their work on the table um, and to the moderators for taking the time to critically unpack such work as well as the role of the fellowship. Um, we are grateful to our colleagues at UVA for their support of the series and really the larger architecture community for your willingness to engage with work that is often both somewhat raw and somewhat radical. Um, and we look forward to meeting and continuing the conversation with all involved in the years to come um, and to following the work of, of future classes of fellows. Uh, I'll turn it to Kyle. Yeah, so for everyone, we hope that the series has provided some insight into the critical position the fellowship holds within the discipline and specifically within um, architectural academia. We hope that the contraction of fellowship opportunities in the wake of the global pandemic will be met with a renewed expansion of such positions as universities overcome the challenges presented over the course of the last year, allowing the vehicle um, of the fellowship uh, as one for experimentation and professional development and critical dialogue to continue to enrich scholarly and creative uh, discourse in architecture. So, uh, so just so everybody knows, in case you missed any of our sessions, um, recordings of all five Projecting Fellows events um, are currently or will be soon available on the University of Virginia School of Architecture YouTube channel um, and are accessible through the event website at projectingfellows.com. So thanks everyone again for your generosity um, and participation throughout the series. And we look forward to continuing conversations with everyone in the future, hopefully in person. Okay, uh, good night and see you all in the future.